We are continuing our study of the life of Elisha, and we come to 2 Kings chapter 6. And if you noticed on your notes, uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 6 and the entirety of chapter 7. So if you'll leave your Bible or your Bible app open uh, and be able to follow along with the reading today, beginning in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24. Now Aram is Syria. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord the king. The king replied, If the Lord doesn't help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor? From the wine press? And then he asked her, What's the matter? She answered, This woman said to me, Give up your son so that we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him, and the next day I said to her, Give up your son so that we may eat him, but she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked, and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. And he said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him. While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to him. The king said, This disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And Elisha replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. So again, if you'll leave your Bibles open, we're coming back to the rest of the story in a few minutes. So here's what's happened. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, has set a siege against Samaria. And you may remember from your study of world history or world civilizations that a siege was a very common military strategy in those days and a very effective one. You would just surround your enemy, shut them off from all outside supplies. If they got their water from outside, you shut off their water supply and you just waited them out. And eventually the water was gone, eventually the food was gone, and they would end up surrendering or else they would all be so weak that you could just take the city without any issue. And that is effective, and it's certainly effective in this story when you've got women, you know, cannibalizing their own children. And when you've got a donkey's head selling for 80 shekels of silver. Now, Again, remember that the donkey was an unclean animal to the Jews, and a good Jew wouldn't be eating it. And so that means, you know, they're, they're at the bottom of the barrel. They have gone as far as they can go. They've gotten every bit of food they can. And the head of a donkey doesn't have much meat. At, well, I don't, I don't know for sure. But, but I assume that the head of a donkey doesn't have a whole lot of meat on it. And, and 80 shekels is two pounds of silver. Now, the, the price of silver today is a little over $24 an ounce. So that means that this head of a donkey was selling for over $700. Now, you've got to be awfully hungry to pay $700 you know, for a donkey's head. And then the NIV says, talks about a quarter of a cab of seed pods. Well, you, that, and they sold for $48 in today's money. 
But if you'll notice, you may have a little editor's note down at the bottom of that verse, or you may have a translation that instead of saying seed pods, it says dove dung. Now that just adds a whole different level to a famine, doesn't it? When you're going to pay $48 for two ounces of dove dung. Now I don't know what you do with it after you buy it, but I think the scripture is letting us know we're in bad times. You know, this is rough. Things are not good. And then you have this woman terrified, bawling her eyes out. And the king says, what's wrong? And she says, well, my neighbor lady says, we don't have anything to eat. So here's what we'll do. Today we'll eat your son and tomorrow we'll eat your son, my son. And the lady says, I go tomorrow and, and she's hidden her son. It, it's worth the effort of getting online or coming out to church today for me to give you this piece of advice. If you are ever in a situation where you're talking to a neighbor about eating your children, don't offer yours first. Okay? Just, just, just don't. If you're in that bad of a situation, you don't go first. It's okay to be selfish in that kind of a situation. Just some words of advice from your good buddy PK. So, can we just say this to start with? Desperate times don't always call for desperate measures. I mean, I know we hear that. But desperate times don't always call for desperate measures because God has resources we don't know anything about. What they did not know was that the famine was about a day or two away from being gone. They thought, we all going to die. But God knew better. Please remember, God has resources that you don't have. God has resources we don't know anything about. The famine was almost over, but they didn't know it. Isn't it true that sometimes our panic causes us to do things that aren't necessary? Most of us are old enough to remember when waterbeds were the thing. We, we never had one. I would get seasick on it, I think. But, but, you know, a lot of people had waterbeds. And I heard about a man who had a king-size waterbed, and he woke up one morning and there was a puddle of water in the middle of it. He goes, oh, man, I got a leak. And he had to, you know, he had no way to drain it in the house. And so he's, he's trying to get it down the stairs and he's trying to get it out in his yard where he can fill it all the way up and see where the leak is. And he loses control over it. And that big old ball just rolls down the hill up against a bunch of bushes with prickly leaves on it. And it's just ruined. And he's so aggravated that he just decides, I'm just going to put a regular bed in my bedroom. And he gets a standard bed and puts it in his bedroom. And the next morning he wakes up to a puddle of water in the middle of his bed because the upstairs toilet was leaking. See, sometimes our panic causes us to do things that aren't necessary. So calm down, slow down. Because sometimes and oftentimes, God's answer comes as we wait patiently for him. Wait on the Lord, the scripture tells us, time after time after time. And often his answers come by waiting patiently for him. Man, that is hard to do. I don't wait real well. I don't wait real well at red lights or stop signs or in front of the microwave when we're making popcorn. I just don't wait well. But an important spiritual lesson is learning to wait patiently on God. Again, what they did not know was the famine was almost over. Desperate times don't always call for desperate measures. But the king blames Elisha. And in verse 31, he basically says, I'm going to have his head by the end of the day. Which reminds us 
that sin has consequences? Because this Syrian attack was because of Israel's sin. Sin has consequences. But isn't it true that often innocent people get blamed for the consequences? Have you always been in a situation where you were the innocent one, but you got blamed? Now, again, we, we remember we just studied this um, last week, that when the Syrian army was fighting against Israel, God would tell Elisha where the attack was coming. And then Elisha will tell the king, don't go there, that's where they're waiting on you. And time after time after time, Elisha saved the king from destruction. But all that's forgotten now because they're in the middle of a famine and the king says, it's Elisha's fault and I'm going to get him. And he says in verse 33, why should I wait for the Lord any longer? That is a powerful question that we need to think about for a moment. I think we can infer from that that God had sent word to the king wait. And the king finally says, I can't wait any longer. Now, I would imagine having one of your subjects coming to you and saying, we just ate my son, would, would cause you to be a little shaken up. But the king decides, finally, I'm not going to wait anymore. Why should I wait any longer? Beware when you hear your spirit saying, why am I waiting any longer? You know, I, you know I, it's like the lady who honestly prayed to the Lord, Lord, I bring this situation to you and I'm giving you 10 days. And if you don't do something about it in 10 days, I'm going to take matters into my own hands because somebody's got to do something. And so many times we feel that way. Why should I wait any longer? But that's the lesson. Wait on God's timing. His timing is always perfect. Sometimes when he says no, it's not because what we want is wrong. It's that the timing's wrong. And, and so over and over through this lesson, we hear, wait on God's timing. Because Elisha says, things are going to change overnight. And he says, about this time tomorrow, chapter 7, a sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, Two C is a barley for a shekel. Now, that was not bargain basement prices, but it was a huge drop from paying $700 for a donkey's head. And what he's telling them is, if you'll just be patient, tomorrow everything's going to change for the better. Wait on God's timing. But there was a guy there. Apparently the king was... was getting a little weak, and, and he was had somebody with him that he was leaning on. And that person, that officer, on whom the king was leaning, said, and, and apparently he says it in a very hostile way, even if the Lord should open the floodgates or the windows of heavens, could this happen? He, he's not doubting, he's just not believing. And there's a difference. You know, it, it, he may have said, well, you know, that would be great. I find that hard to believe, but that'd really be great if that would happen. But he doesn't do that. And apparently his attitude is such that Elisha says, you're going to see it, but you won't be able to eat any of it. We'll come back to his story in just a few minutes. But that's the lesson for us. God can open the windows of heaven. At least he had a little bit of insight. Yes, God can open the floodgates of heaven. More than you can imagine, God can open the floodgates of heaven. Sometimes we think things are impossible, and we're wrong. Because one of the great verses in the Christmas story is the angel saying to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. And that's good news for you and me today. You may have heard some of these illustrations of when people have been wrong a Yale University management professor wrote this on one of his students' papers. The concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. 
The student was Fred Smith. The concept of the paper was reliable overnight delivery. And you may know that Fred Smith invented basically Federal Express. You may have read that Decca Records in 1962 said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. And Decca lost out on the Beatles. The chairman of the Office of Patents in 1899 said, everything that can be invented has been invented. <laughs> so, you know, people have been wrong before. And, and, and somebody said, when you say, oh, this is impossible, if you'll just listen, you'll hear heaven laughing. <laughs> because nothing is impossible with God. He can open the floodgates of heaven. He can open the windows of heaven. He wants to do more in your life than you can even imagine. I love that verse in Ephesians 3.20 where Paul says, unto him that is able to do. And then Paul's good about stacking superlatives. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. Most of us can think more than we can really put into words. Paul says, look, God, I love that. He, he could have just said, well, God can do more than you can imagine. So, oh, no, no, no. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or even think. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, it's not entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who, who love him. God can open the windows of heaven. He has resources we don't know anything about. And we're getting ready to read about them. Starting in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we'll die. If we stay here, we'll die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. It's kind of like, we're going to die. You know, we might as well take a chance with the Syrians. So at dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. And when they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. I guess we could have entitled this sermon, you know, when you're being laid siege to by invisible people, you know, or by, you know, when, you, when you're worried about people who aren't there. The Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. God has resources you don't know anything about. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. And, and finally, their conscience gets the best of them. At tent three, the conscience gets the best of them. Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we're keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp. No one was there, not a sound of anyone only tethered horses and donkeys, and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeeper shouted the news, and it was reported within the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I'll tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we're starving. They've left their camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they will surely come out. Then we will take them alive and get into the city. One of his officers answered, basically, what do we have to lose? Have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yeah, they'll only be like all these Israelites who are doomed. So let's send them to find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army. 
He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. They followed them as far as the Jordan, and they found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So a sea of the finest flour sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. You remember the skeptic? Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died just as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. It happened as the man of God had said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a sea of the finest flowers to sell for a shekel, two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer had said to the man of God, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? The man of God had replied, you will see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of it. And that's exactly what happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Whoa. It's a fascinating story. You may or may not have been familiar with it. It's a fascinating story. And it reminds us, when we think about these four lepers, that God can use anybody who's willing to take a risk. The heroes of this story are those lepers. Lepers who were outcasts from their society. And God can use anybody who's willing to take a risk. And these men were willing to take a risk. Now, it really wasn't much of a risk because basically they're outside the city because they're not allowed in. But even if they would go in, they're going to die because the city's under siege. If they stay where they are, they're going to die. I've heard sermons preached on that. Why sit we here until we die? You know, when are you going to do something? And if we go to the Syrian army, they may kill us. But they might not, so that seems to be our best chance. At least they were willing to take a risk. And God can use people who are willing to take a risk. Because the life of faith is all about taking risks. The life of faith is all about saying, Lord, I can't see it with my physical eyes, but if you're telling me to, to do this, I'm going to do this. It's Peter in the boat saying, Lord, I don't think I can walk on the water, but if it's you, you tell me to come, and, and I'll come. And, and God can use anybody who's willing to take a risk. And he can do amazing things on our behalf. <laughs> it's a great story. The, the Syrian army is there. They've got Samaria totally surrounded. But all of a sudden, they hear the sounds of chariots and horses, and they're convinced that there's armies coming to attack them. And they don't pack up and leave. They just leave. And they leave everything behind. God used the Syrian army to get rid of the famine in Samaria. Don't you love it when God uses the enemies <laughs> to meet your needs? But the lepers go in, and, and you can't blame them. They've been ostracized from society ever since they've had leprosy. And they go in, and man, there's food here, and there's drink here, and, and there's supplies here. And so they take some and hide it. And then eventually they realize, this isn't right. This is good news. Our enemy's gone. The siege is over. We need to go let them know. Because you see, You've already filled in lesson number seven. We are blessed to be a blessing. We're not blessed to keep it to ourselves. We are blessed to be a blessing. You know, there are reservoirs that hold everything back. There are rivers that what come into it flow out from it. Too many Christians try to be reservoirs. We try to store up everything that God does for us when what he wants us to do is be a river of blessing, to take what he blesses us with to bless other people. They said, look, we've got good news, and we need to tell the other people good news. Folks, we have good news. Yeah. We know Jesus. 
We know that God is sovereign. We know that God loves us. We know that Christ can change your life. And it's not right that we keep it to ourselves. People need to know. And we need to let them know about Jesus. But the sobering truth from that man who basically just said, I don't believe it, is that unbelief has a price. And as the people go out to enjoy the, the food that's there for them, he is trampled to death. Because unbelief always has a price. In other words, it's always riskier not to believe God than it is to believe God. You know, it's always riskier to, to disbelieve than it is to believe. So we get this story and it's like, what in the world does this have to do with us today? You may be asking that question. But maybe you know what it has to do with you because you may be struggling with some kind of a famine in your life. You may be struggling with some kind of situation or circumstances that seem overwhelming and you're about ready to quit. Hopefully from this lesson, you learn don't quit, you know, don't, don't give up. And, and I had the sermon done and couldn't come up with a title. And since Mike's doing the online stuff, you know, I, I tried to put a title out there and, and all I had was just the reference. But the, the longer I lived in the story and reread the story and kept, you know, reflecting on the lesson, the more I realize that overarching this whole event is this principle. Don't panic. God is still God. And no matter how dire the situation is, don't panic. God is still God. Don't go eating your children. <laughs> God is still God. Don't panic. When you've gone as far as you can go, God hadn't even started yet. Don't panic. He is still God. And he can open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. And when you are blessed, be a blessing to other people. Use what God has blessed you with to bless others. And please keep on trusting him because your answer may be closer than you think. And tomorrow, the whole situation may turn around. That thing that has you all in knots may be totally resolved tomorrow. We don't know. But God has resources we don't know anything about. Keep trusting him. Don't panic. I know that sounds silly. You know, in the year 2020, don't panic. But don't panic. God is still God. Regardless of what happens politically, God is still God. Regardless of what happens health-wise, God is still God. Keep trusting him. He has resources we don't know anything about. Keep our trust in him. The answer may be closer than you can imagine. Father, strengthen our faith. I kind of feel like the man who very honestly said to you, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And Lord, help us to, to keep hold of your promises. Help us to remember that you are God and you're not panicked. You're not losing sleep. You're not pacing heaven wondering what to do. You have resources we don't know anything about. So help us to keep our faith in you. Help us to keep our focus on you. Because as our perspective stays on you, it's easier for us to keep our faith as we face the challenges of our daily lives. So renew our faith and our hope. Strength for today and hope for tomorrow. Because you are the faithful God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. God bless you. Thanks for being here. You're dismissed.